Hi, Will. Thank you for coming onto the podcast. Adrian, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Really happy to make this work today. The last time we tried, it couldn't work because of technical issues. So hopefully things will fly today. So to begin with, could you help us to understand in your own words, what is New Campus? Yeah, so New Campus, we're a new leadership school. But the thesis is on really building the next generation of people, leaders, managers, hyper growth companies all across Southeast Asia. And the way that we do that is through our cohort based program, which focuses on our leadership capability. We've been around for about three years now, but we see ourselves three years into a 20 year journey building the next hundred year old new school brand. So really excited to share a bit more about sort of our philosophy and how we've evolved over time. I'd like to learn about the backstory behind this. What actually motivated you to get into this space? What's issues or frictions that you actually came across? Often when I'm asked this question, it's, and it really ends up talking about the people around me and the ecosystem that we built over time. But if we were to dial all the way back to 2013, which is where I met my co-founder, Faye, we were both at Accenture looking at new ways to reinvent ourselves and try new career paths. And that ended up taking us to launching our first business together, which was out of all places, a furniture e-commerce platform. Six months down the road, that opened up our opportunities to join an accelerator in Singapore. So in a week, we quit our jobs, we packed our bags and moved overseas. And the first thing that they teach you at JFDI, I Raja Crescent, is why are you the best people to be solving this problem? Why are you the best people in the world to be solving this problem? And we didn't really care much about selling vintage Scandinavian pieces like what's behind me, but how can you really look at ways to help people try to reinvent themselves and explore new careers without that risk? And so the first iteration of New Campus was actually a B to you business to university platform. We built programs with universities all across Southeast Asia, the Middle East, China, focusing on helping students elevate themselves digitally, um, business wise. Um, but we actually had an opportunity come 2018 to launch our own challenger university, which has now become new campus. And with a pandemic, really putting a spotlight on access, new ways of learning, new campus eventually evolved into a new business school and the focus right now is really helping this new generation of leaders, especially in this part of the world, figure out their leadership style, figuring out how do they lead with pride, lead with confidence. And I mentioned earlier, Adrian, that it's actually gone beyond me. It's no longer the leadership or management team, but the team of 25 that we brought on, the influences that we work with, the learners that have come through our journey. Um, so I think as we look forward, what I'm really excited about is how do you lift the region? Um, what does lifting the region look like? And how do you look at people in the region that you can help really redefine their way of paying it forward and reinventing others? How's the journey like for anyone who go through a new campus and how does it differ from the way traditional management school conduct their lessons? I think what's been really interesting for us in the pandemic is, again, putting spotlight on how inaccessible the education space was. So personally for me, I was, I was priced out of going to business school and most of the team, if anything, all of the team came from very similar backgrounds. Our parents were immigrants moving to different parts of the world. They sent us to a good school. They helped us pave our way into a good path, but then you realize what happens after that. And so over time, we also understand how important education is. And when we think about education, you look at what's out there in the world. So you have your traditional schools, your MBAs, your Harvards, your Stanfords, but then on the other end of the spectrum, your online programs, your online MOOCs. And when you kind of balance those two, one is accessible content, but without the interaction, the engagement, and then you also have the really immersive programs, but are just too expensive. So for us, it's really, how do you take the best of both worlds, but apply it for this new day and age. And so the way that we run our programs, it's high, it's live led, but it's, I think for us, 
thesis is how do you reduce the cost to 1%, but still have the same level of interaction, the same level of quality, but also works for this evolving economy and industry. And so we've been around for about two, three years now. We've had a bit of a 3000 alum, all of which are first time people leaders from your grabs, your carousels, your bookla parks in Southeast Asia. They're not thinking about spending 50, a hundred thousand to do a two year degree, but they're undertaking five, 10, 15 people under their wing. And so we want to be that journey for them as they evolve as new leaders and new leaders under them. And I think, again, we are so early into this journey, but we're part of this growth stage of emerging unicorns, emerging organizations that are coming out of Southeast Asia. I also understand one of the key challenge that people face in traditional management school is the fact that sometimes the curriculum can be outdated. And when it comes to refreshing the curriculum, it seems to take forever. Why is that the case and how do you guys work around that issue since curriculum de development does take a lot of time? We built curriculum with universities for almost four years. We did it with top tier, mid tier, new countries, new geographies with governments as well. So we understand how slow it was. It almost takes you two years to deploy. And by the time that happens, it's already outdated. With New Campus, we've taken more of an agile model, really working with leaders at the forefront of their field. We run roundtables, we work with them to co-create. We have our own in-house pedagogy that we validate with our learners. But at the end of the day, it's about how do you actually keep at the tempo of these hyper-growth companies that are shifting, innovating, pivoting every day. And then the second part of it, Adrian, is really looking at the delivery load. So you obviously have your traditional institutions, your local trainers that are trying to take it online for the first time. But for us, we're digitally native. So how do you actually build these Zoom learning experiences, these collaborative remote experiences that work, that get people excited, but more importantly, get them engaged over time. And so we actually have our own team of learning experience designers, R&D folks that look at not only the program delivery, so making sure that there's ROI in the learner's journey and the business that sponsors or supports the learners going through. But there's secondly, R&D on the learning experience. How do you make it as intuitive, as addictive, but also embraces this new norm of working? I, I was also informed that you guys have actually formed a Dean's Council and invited a number of business leaders. Maybe you can share with us a bit more on who they are and how would their support be relevant in helping you to develop a curriculum? That's something I'm so excited about, Adrian. For us, again, New Campus has started off with this small group of ambitious young kids, really. But over time, if we're building a hundred year old brand, it has to go beyond us. And the first cohort of Dean Council really came with working with advisors, influencers, business leaders in the region. So Quack, he brought Netflix into Southeast Asia. Now he's taking Aichi equivalent global. You have Susan, wicked smart, learning nerd. She led the leadership development team at Gojek. And then you also have Momo who led design at Ikea um, and IDEO. And so they really formed the first cohort of our Dean's Council that look at a, identifying business leaders that we need to work with, B, validating curriculum, but more importantly, elevating the brand over time. No longer can an institution or education platform think of just working with academia for 20 years, but how do you actually work with people at the forefront of their field who are genuinely passionate about helping build the next generation of leaders? And so we see them as really the first node out of us decentralizing leaders over time. There's actually one, one really interesting recruitment company in Spain that I look up to, they're quite unknown. They do CEO headhunting. And so they only have a team of about 150 ex CEOs all across the world who understands how to hire, motivate, fulfill a CEO's mindset. So they come from your Coca-Cola's, your Pepsi's and whatnot. But for us, it really applies the same analogy, Adrian. How do you actually create the right type of leadership program? that works for the Asian economy, but more importantly, it's designed by new leaders a few steps ahead. So we've been talking about the solutions that New Campus actually provide. Let's take a step back and help us understand what are the current challenges that 
young middle management in Asia are currently facing and struggling with? There's a few ways to look at this, Adrian. And we've kind of been in this landscape for almost a decade now. The first wave of leaders would be likely Western European leaders helicoptered into the region. The second is you have your expats, your highway, your attorneys that have a balance of both. But then the third wave is actually building grassroots. And so one of the biggest challenges and opportunities in Indonesia, in Philippines, in Thailand, in Southeast Asia is how do you actually develop the fundamentals from the ground up? These leaders are moving from wickedly smart and capable individual contributors, but now managing teams in a remote fashion, thinking differently, having that level of growth mindset to empower and build confidence in the people around them. And so where we really coming in, where we come in is really is building a program and a cohort that works for them, but also works for the culture. Because I think there's enough challenger schools that are built in Europe in the West. For us, we're really the first to be doing in Asia. And that has a lot of its challenges, but a lot of, um, a lot of intrinsic motivators for myself and the team as well. Because if you think about Southeast Asia, it's incredibly fragmented, but leaders like you and I, and the folks listening to this, we're leading teams in a remote way. We're leading teams across the region. So for us, it's about how do you defrag the culture, but also build something that makes sense for a young product manager at a serious big fintech company coming out of Jakarta. So it's really looking at the design, but also making that design accessible to those that otherwise wouldn't have considered doing it in the first place. Could you give us an example of the kind of learning differences that you see from learners in Asia, Southeast Asia, for example, versus someone in Europe or even US? I think it's completely different problems, Adrian. But two of our biggest markets right now is uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And when we interview and onboard these learners, it's also balancing their upbringing, it's balancing their language, it's balancing the culture and stigma in the way that they're building their organizations. So for example, what we're very proud of is that 80% of our learners are women, not by design, but eventually as we've kind of evolved our school, it's building these safe, inclusive environments for people to thrive that otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to. The second thing is 100% of our learners are people of color. So really taking into place, how do you mix and match accountability partners, mentors, design the program that sticks, um, designing the coaching that lands, but more importantly, the companies as they evolve in their respective industries, their respective geographies, how do you actually build it so it works for this type of environment? So we look a lot at culture, um, cross-cultural intelligence is one of our sort of core themes that we're investing into this year. But at the end of the day, it's again, designing Asian leadership from the ground up, not taking something that's been cookie cutted or built over 50, 100 years and applying it to this part of the world. And overall, what are your take on the way things are being conducted when it comes to the learning space? Obviously, with so many things and infusion coming from all angles at the same time, you're looking at WEF telling you, okay, these are the top 10 critical skills that you have to take by 2030 or you're obsolete. And at the same time, you have another area where People are saying, oh, AI automation is going to take jobs away. How does all this infuse and come together? And how can learning play a part in trying to get people better prepared for what is to come? I think there's a lot of signals in the market. And when we talk about the future skills, that's really one segment of uh, supporting new entrants into the workforce. So when we started off doing QLC, the predecessor to New Campus, was really focusing on helping international students be job ready. I think with the whole AI conversations, it's focusing on existing industries, old industries that need to level up, need to reinvent, need to digitize. But for us, the focus is really on this management piece. So you, we know that over the next decade, there's going to be hundreds, thousands of new unicorns, new grabs, new projects, new one championships that are emerging. And so there's a, going to be a middle management layer that is going to struggle to have the right type of mindset and right type of capability. And more specifically, when you look at the existing opportunities, it's either local trainers that is opaque with pricing or delivery methods, and then universities that are completely inaccessible and content is questionable. And so for us, 
It's really looking at the pace of how these industries are moving and the type of leaders that are being born. Where trying to lift leaders in Asia disguised as a challenger university. But the end goal is really looking at how do you give them the right exposure, give them the right network and the right tempo of thinking that allows them to move forward, lead teams and be confident in who they are and therefore build better companies along the way. Leadership training, honestly, based on my interaction with some companies are not exactly uh, top of the priority for a variety of reasons. And for companies that actually attempt to do something, they would just pay a subscription to some learning content and expect their managers to take, to consume those content. Do you think that's the best way forward? And what are the shortcomings when it comes to approaches like that? So we started off selling to three different customer archetypes, L&D, C-suite, and then the business leaders. When you're thinking about doing an education company, it's probably building a business on hard mode. You need to get everything right from the contacts to the content to eventually building the ROI with the mix of both. And so we started off doing the HR side because common sense means you need to go to the L&D leaders. They have the budget they're already spending. But what we've actually seen, Adrian, in Southeast Asia is most of the decisions are actually built and created and owned by the business leaders who care a lot about their people. And so this is actually really similar to the concept of Slack right now, where it's not just about transforming the way that people work in the beginning, but really working with these agile teams that wanted more effective ways of communication. We can argue that's not the case anymore, but for us, where we've actually found a lot of interest and evangelism is working with business leaders that care about investing in their people. Because at the end of the day, we are in the business of people and businesses are in the business of people. And so if you're not looking at who cares a lot about investing in the people, then they're probably not the right type of company that works with us. And so for us right now, why we work with a Dean Council, why we work with these business leaders is because there's an intrinsic motivator on top to eventually lift the region. And so uh, what's been interesting as we've kind of steered away from your HR um, as our buyers is we're also educating HR and L&D leaders to learn about new ways of learning. And one analogy that I love using from an EdTech conference a few years ago is 10 years ago, you would have the chief digital officer who was a vertical in an organization. Now digital is supposedly uh, absolute given for every organization. Likewise, it's happening with learning. You have your CLO, your chief learning officer, but now we're part of the movement of building learning organizations. And I think moving forward, that's how organizations are thinking in terms of retaining, engaging, and empowering their team members to look forward and be innovative, more creative, more resilient, especially in tough times like this. I've also seen, of course, a lot of middle management that really struggle to fill the shoe, the new shoe that they are given, really because they step in from an individual contributor perspective. For the managements out there, what's your advice to them to consider before really putting this person into the opportunity to become a middle manager? So in the case of startups and scale-ups, Adrian, they're moving so fast that they don't even have time to consider it. And you've seen companies that have gone through 20, 30% of people every year because of that leadership gap. And one of the big reasons why people leave companies is not because of the, the organization or the problem solution, but because of poor management. And so what we're actually seeing now is a significant shift of re-looking about how management is designed, especially when companies are exploding from 100, 200, 500, 1,000, that impacts the business overall. And so New Campus is not necessarily the solution for everyone. I think we're really at the forefront of our field, but we're definitely seeing signals in these scale-ups thinking about not only just saying, hey, Adrian, hey, Will, is 10 people under your wing, but how do you give them smaller bite-sized tasks to give them confidence? to move forward and start leading teams in a really proactive way. And so what we're working with our business leaders, with our partners, with our customers is really identifying the right timing when a new manager should be thinking about getting immersive development. I think the corporate world has done it really well because they've built pathways. So you spent two years as a consultant, 
two years as a senior consultant, you take on a few interns and then you move forward. But for most scale-ups, they just have the time. They started off with really good idea. They've survived the death zone. They've raised a lot of capital and now they need to go. And so how do you actually marry up that acceleration with the culture piece, but also building not just sustainable cultures, but the regenerative ecosystems for their team members to thrive over time. And I'm just really excited to be part of that journey and seeing sort of these signals move. Interesting. And what are the future plans for new campus as we move towards the rest of 2022? Last year was a really, really good year for us. I think uh, we've started to to really position ourselves for the right type of branding, leading management training for hypergrowth organizations in Southeast Asia. And we really want to start fulfilling and continuously delivering what we're doing. So we're going to new markets. Um, Southeast Asia is going to be our core. But also, how do you evolve beyond management training 101? Our management essentials that you can see on our website is really focusing on that six to 12 week journey. But eventually we want to build a full scale alternative business degree. Um, there's bells and whistles that are coming into play. So you have your credential that we're acquiring, which empowers our learners to actually have a global degree under their belt. But then secondly, how do you actually continuously help our alumni and beyond evolve as better leaders. So we're working really closely with our council, we're working very closely with our business leaders to continuously shape the way that we're designing learning experiences, but also how do you make the content, the curriculum, the community uh, relevant as we go towards the end of the year. But again, we're looking at this from a very long-term perspective. We are going on to be five years to a 20 year journey, building the next hundred year old school. So if we keep innovating, creating, making sure that the content, the, the team, the ecosystem is agile, then that's where you carve yourself as a differentiator. And I think we're very bullish about that. Thank you so much. And for people who's, uh, who's keen to learn more about yourself as well as New Campus, where can they go to? If you wait, I'm always open to jump on a Zoom coffee. Y'all can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Hello, Will Fan. Um, but also check us out on newcampus.co. Um, really excited to continue happy to, you know, continue working together. Thanks so much for making time today for this discussion and uh, come on this podcast. Uh, what you've just mentioned will be listed into the show notes and I wish you all the best in the rest of the journey with New Campus. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to more information about our guests and their businesses. If you enjoyed this podcast, it will be helpful to give a review on iTunes or follow me on Spotify. If you're using Overcast, please hit the star button under the episode. That will help get this episode and podcast out to more people who may find it useful. I'll see you in the next episode of The Agent Han Show.